Hey Chris, glad to uh, continue the uh, training with you and in this video I want to talk about the preliminary analysis steps I go through every time I research a company on a preliminary basis. Um, please keep in mind since we've already talked about this quite this company quite a bit, at least on a preliminary basis, I'm going to go through this slower than usual and explain things, but um, I'm not going to go through it nearly as fast as I would if I was going through it on my own. Um, still even though we've discussed it before first thing I do is go to Morningstar open up the key ratios tab and the financials tab in another page have those handy and ready alright first thing I look at here um, I do want to make one note on this company before we get too far though this on Morningstar I found it um, the other day I couldn't find it on Morningstar I found it, it's listed on the Frankfurt Exchange. Um, you'll notice the Euro symbol there. Um, and Euro right here as well. Um, and this is all listed in Euros on this exchange. Go to Google, same ticker. This one is listed on the Singapore Exchange. I'm going to be referencing this one throughout, but I'm going to be using Morningstar um, because that's where I do all my preliminary analysis from um, but please keep in mind some of the numbers may be different because I'm going to be basing this off the Singaporean exchange and not the Frankfurt exchange like it's listed on Morningstar so please keep that in mind um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of these differences as we go along um, you'll, the first one you'll notice here is the difference in market cap 28.9 million on Morningstar and 44.4 million on Google. This is likely due to a conversion rate exchange difference. Um, I'll look at that later and let you know if there's any difference or if that is the reason. That is my guess um, at this point, but I will get back to you on this one. Uh, next thing I look at okay this is the preliminary analysis I use on every company I look at um, again I'm things of note I mention here this is the difference here in the uh, two listings I state here that it could be an arbitrage opportunity but most likely it's a most likely it's a it's a conversion rate exchange rate um, on a currency is what it is Okay, from here, put in the market cap again. I note here we're going to be paying attention to the Google one um, only for this analysis. I also enter the 2.5% dividend yield, um, which is pretty good for a company of its size. Price to book 0 0.5, excellent. Um, and I must have deleted this off at some point. I must have been researching an insurance company. Price to book. Trend 12 month. 0 0.5. Okay. Next thing I look from here. And I don't make note of this in the uh, sheet. But if there's any insider ownership, a lot of times for these smaller companies, it doesn't state any kind of insider ownership on here. Um, and we can always look at the company financial reports and I have that information in the notes already or Yahoo Finance as well from here cash flow positive cash for free cash flow and then the last year's quarter this time zero this year um, fantastic total liabilities compared to total assets 86 million dollar difference which is gigantic for a 44 million dollar company um, again I we've already talked about this why this is somewhat off and it's been adjusted because the inventory levels um, but 
I'll get back to that when I get to the notes as well. We can talk about that after we um, in our next training video or in our next training session. Um, what I found out in the financial reports about that from here. I don't look at anything else. This is not good, but to look at everything else, I go to the key ratios tab we've already opened. All right, from here, look at the revenue going straight down from 94 million in 2007 to 35 million in the trailing 12 month period. That is a horrible loss of business. Um, again, something I've seen by looking at the company financials, I'm doing this one a bit backwards since we've already talked about this one on a preliminary basis. I've looked at the financials already so I know what has been going on. But uh, if for this video, I'm going to stick to what as I'm as if this was a um, complete preliminary analysis. So the next thing I look at is the operating margin negative 3.2 in the trailing 12 month period. Make note of that. 2% in the five year average. Calculate that. I leave out trailing 12 month. Use the last five here. 1.6 plus 1.5 plus 6.6. .6. Plus 10.6 equals divided by 5. 5.1% um, on average. But we've talked about what happens in a, in a previous training session. We talked about what happens when a company's ratios, margin, the profitability metrics, anything drop or rise by a significant margin in a short time period. What happens in that case? Most of the time, I would smooth these out and use the average 5.1%. But since the last year and the trailing 12 months are both negative, I would go to the financial reports to figure out why, um, why, if that's going to be sustained, and what, and that would lead me to the answer of what I would do in this situation. In this situation, since I've already read the company financials, I would go with the negative 3.2% trailing 12 month period in my analysis which of course means you can't value the company on an operating margin basis um, makes you or it disallows you from calculating things like ROIC and some of the other metrics I use and teach um, but I would use that because the business has been unprofitable and losing profitability and revenue um, for a little while now it, looks like it could turn around according to the financial statements but I don't count on turnarounds when it comes to that I go on what the numbers say now and what they've said in the past and what the financials say now and what they've said in the past and what these financials and numbers say at least on an operating margin basis is I would leave this in all my calculations to this number right here I wouldn't smooth that out to the 5.1 percent because I don't believe that tells a truthful picture of how the company is operating now um, Next thing I look at is share count, at least on the preliminary analysis page. Share count has stayed about the same for since 2008, actually has stayed the same since 2008. So make a note of that. Book value per share has stayed almost exactly the same since 2010. Since 2010. Morningstar ROIC, and this is negative 1.1% right now. Negative. In the trailing 12 month period, in the trailing, in the last five years, again, five years right there. 0.24 negative plus 3.7. I don't 
I round these numbers up um, is what I do plus 4.1 for example on 2014 I round up to 4.1 plus 4.7 I'll go use one decimal as well if our numbers are slightly different that is why 3.7 percent 3.7 percent all right ROE negative 0.8 0.8 percent um, and in future in a future training session um, I will explain in detail what all of these kind of metrics mean and another one that I uh, look at here shortly um, cash conversion cycle free uh, free cash flow to sales um, and then some relative valuations and earnings yield value basic earnings yields um, I'll explain all what this means in a future training session what it means for the company what things like ROC are uh, what a higher ROE means when compared to ROIC um, what that means for the company's debt levels what the cash conversion cycle means for the company's inventory levels um, things like that we've already talked about some of that in prior training sessions but I'll talk in depth about all of this all these kind of metrics in future um, training sessions okay back to ROE Point one plus over plus four point two plus four point nine plus six point three equals divided by five three point nine percent rounded up trailing twelve month three point nine percent okay from here I go to the cash flow tab was we were on the profitability tab that's what it comes up automatically as when you um, go scroll down the Key ratios tab go over to the cash flow tab with the free cash flow to sales here is a fantastic number 11.5 percent in a trailing 12 month period percent and the average is Again, there's a huge jump in this number in the last uh, in 2016 and the trailing 12 month period so I would go to the go to the um, financials to figure out what's been going on and honestly on this part I do not have a great answer um, I make note of this in the notes I took right here let's see what I said specifically about the free cash flow uh, there's a red flag I've highlighted. We'll talk about that the next time we talk. Inventories. Here we go. In their cash flow. Normally I wouldn't even consider this in a preliminary analysis. Um, and I'll talk about this. But on a preliminary basis, you see the reported huge jump in free cash flow and you get excited. That is fantastic, of course, especially for a small company producing $12 million in free cash flow, um, $44 million company producing $12 million plus in cash flow. That's fantastic. Um, but when I looked at their financials, and I'll talk about this more, it's not truly as it seems. Um, we'll talk about this the next time we chat. But on a preliminary basis, this is fantastic, but this is why you always must read the financial reports you can't go off metrics and ratios and things that it talks about on um, sites like Morningstar Yahoo Finance Google Finance you have to read the financial statements to figure out what's going on with the company on a deep basis and in this case I've never seen what this company does with their free cash flow I've never seen it um, and how what they did with their free cash flow statement so that's something we'll talk about in a future session. For now, let's get back to the preliminary analysis. Next thing we'll talk about is the cash conversion cycle. Again, something we'll talk about 
we've already talked about a little bit and why it's so important, but we'll talk about this again here on a preliminary basis. Huge, massive jump since 2007 from 216 days. Let me make note of this, 216 days. And I make notes of everything I do so I don't have to rely on my memory in the past or in the future when I'm trying to make my analysis solid. I don't want to rely on any guessing. I want to rely on hard facts and what I was thinking as I was researching the company to 600.3 days. 600.3 days in the trailing probe. Period or a rise of 600.3 minus 216 divided by 600.3. 64%, that is scary. 64%, that means the cash conversion cycle means, and we've already talked about this a little bit, but it's such an important concept that I'm gonna go over everything kind of we talked about again, and hopefully it'll begin to make more sense the more you learn about it and with future trainings as well. This number is one of the most important numbers I look at on a preliminary basis, like we talked about the other day, why? Because this one number, I can tell from comparing this number to this number, or even in most cases, I take go back five years, but this one's such a huge tr jump, more than almost tripled in, uh, let's see, a seven-year time period, ten-year time period, uh, almost tripled. This means going from this number to this number, this number almost tripling, in 10 years means that the company is having a harder time selling its products which means it's having a longer or it's taking longer for them to get paid this is the amount of days this entire cycle takes right here these three things damn it these three are what goes into the cash conversion cycle again we talked about this the other day but I want to reiterate what everything means day sales outstanding means how long something takes to sell days inventory is how much inventory the company has and how long that inventory has been taking to sell and the payables period is how long it takes them to pay their suppliers so here another Normally, I just look at this metric, the cash conversion cycle as a whole, but in this, I can spot another problem. Payables period, they're paying their suppliers in thir an average of 31 days, but it's taking them 116 days to sell their products, and their inventory is sitting there for 515 days. This is a massive, massive, massive problem. Um, the longer it takes, a company to sell its products the longer it takes them to get cash for it to buy future products and the longer it takes them to pay their suppliers eventually um, this could lead to several problems some of which could be problems with their suppliers maybe their suppliers are getting tired of getting paid later in this case it's not a huge jump but at some point if they continue to not sell their inventory they're either not going to buy from the supplier anymore or they're going to have to start buy, uh, pushing out their payment period longer, which suppliers don't like. Um, the longer it takes them to sell products, the longer it takes them to build cash, to build future products, to put in R&D, capital expenditures, stuff like that. And one of the most important problems is the day's inventory. I can tell from this number. Let's go to the balance sheet. Uh, normally, I wouldn't go to the balance sheet yet, but I want to talk about this again. The balance sheet go to the income or go to financials income statement usually pop are always popped up first and then go to the balance sheet i always look at the quarterly to get the most recent information inventories so those have risen but let's go back and look at the inventories their inventories have risen by about is that seven million 
seven million Singaporean dollars in five years. When inventories rise while sales fall and it takes longer for the company to sell their products, it leads to massive problems, some of which I've already talked about, but the biggest one is, or the biggest potential one is that the company may have to write down their inventories at some point. This would lead to a reduction in balance sheet book value, a reduction in value of the entire company. Um, since value investors most of the time go by balance sheet first, at least on a preliminary basis, um, on evaluation, this would lower the company's NCAV, Ben Graham, NCAV valuation, tangible book valuation if they had to write down inventories. And again, normally I wouldn't know this because this would be a preliminary analysis, but since I've looked at the financials, they have begun writing down some of their inventories. So again, this is why the cash conversion cycle is such a major, major important thing I look at um, during any pre preliminary analysis of any company. Of course, this number is more important for companies like manufacturers, retailers, um, companies with hard assets they sell, stuff like that. Um, and it can also be negative, like we talked about, like a Walmart or Amazon their cash conversion cycle I haven't checked in a while but last time I did check they were both negative which means which is fantastic they're paying they're getting their products selling them and paying their suppliers before they have to pay their or their uh, before they have to pay their suppliers so essentially the customers are paying for the products before they even have them in hand and have to buy them um, fantastic problem or not it's not a fantastic problem it's a fantastic thing when that happens because you don't have to push out sales you don't have to wait for cash flow to come in that's why Walmart and one of the reasons Walmart and Amazon are so fantastic uh, such fantastic businesses because they turn their inventory so fast um, that can lead to competitive advantages economies of scale um, economies of scale um, and that's one of the major advantages Amazon and Walmart has is they, while they might not make the biggest margin on each sale, they can offer their customers lower prices, um, get them their products faster and make smaller margins, but on a higher, much higher volume of products. Um, this keeps competition out and leads to a bunch of other great things happening so again this is why the cash conversion cycle is so important and why i've spent so much time we why we spent so much time talking about it in our training sessions and while i'll continue to talk about it every time it comes up but for now let's go back to the okay ev i can't measure this i can't talk about these because EBIT is negative. I can't measure the free cash flow one. Let me see. Let me make sure. And I can do the EV. Okay, so let's do the EV to free cash flow real quick just so you can get an idea of how I calculate things. And this, these are notes from a prior thing. I just copied and pasted over here for any notes. I notice um, things like that, any minor valuations I do down here minor valuations this is from a previous company I've analyzed um, stuff like that I put notes down here oh and other notes uh, we didn't talk about that let's go back and talk about that first before we calculate the cash flow um, I also make note in the notes section of the preliminary analysis checklist that I use of the cash and short-term investments compared to short-term debt oh, damn it short-term debt and long-term debt um, this company has zero debt so they have net cash position um, of 32.6 percent on their balance sheet which is fantastic of course it's what we look for we want healthy balance sheet uh, strong companies um, especially with these kind of small tiny companies um, don't want a lot of debt want a lot of cash on hand it's for investments growing the business uh, paying dividends like this company does um, growing the business all that sorts of stuff so I make notes of that and other 
minor valuations um, in this case and we can talk about that at some other point in the future training because in this one we can only do the free cash flow relative valuation and earnings yield because these EBIT is negative so N A N A and again I would make I make notes of everything EBIT is negative period okay so let's go back and calculate the enterprise value how do we do that again I'm going to use the Singaporean number because all their financials are in Singaporean dollars on here except for the market cap. Market cap is in euros, so I'm gonna use everything in Singaporean dollars so I don't have to convert it at the end, which you need to, if you're looking at foreign companies, you have to remember to do. Um, and that's something a lot of people miss as well, and I can show you how to do that, that in a future training as well. It's simple, um, but it's something, it's a very important step that could lead to missing out on companies or buying a company you don't want to. If you don't remember how to do that, it can lead to massive uh, mistakes if you don't convert that over okay so let's go to market cap of 44.4 I'll just do a EB calculation market cap of 44.4 I'm gonna put the dollar sign in there so that's in Singaporean dollars minus cash and cash equivalents plus debt plus cash minus Okay, this is also, um, remember, and I had to actually look this up because I, I knew I would always forget something because most companies don't have preferred shares anymore. Um, preferred shares would be subtracted as well or added, um, excuse me. Preferred shares, if there are any, there aren't any in this case and there aren't in most cases anymore and that's why I forget about that and that's why I had to look that up. Um, but the basic EV calculation you'll do most of the time is as follows market cap minus cash and cash equivalents plus debt that's it uh, so cash and cash equivalents are I'm gonna go back to the balance sheet it's 26 26 plus debt of zero. This equals minus 26 equals 18.4 SGD. Oh, 18.4 million SGD. Okay. So now that we have this number, go back up here, 18.4, what's the cash flow? I should have left that tab open. There's the problems I was having. Okay, minus, I'll round that, these numbers up as well, so that'll be four, divided by four. Oop. Four equals 18.4 divided by 4 equals 4.6 that is a fantastic number I look for anything under 8 um, the lower the better anything under 8 why um, it works for me 
and also that's what Warren Buffett looks for when he does these kind of calculations as well and obviously it's worked for him it's worked for me so far it means there's a nice margin of safety there um, the inverse of this is the earnings yield so 4 divided by 18.4 percent equals percent again I like to have everything this is kind of I'm just a little OCD about some of this stuff but I want it all to match up I want it all to make sense if I'm even looking back at this years later um, even up top most of the time I have a note to myself I'll just add it right here all numbers are in millions of SGD unless noted otherwise Again, I do that so that I don't have to play a guessing game if I came back years later and wondered if this number, is that in US dollars? I have a note up here if that's it listed on Frankfurt, is that in euros, is that in um, anything else? I wouldn't have to remember that with that note right there. Um, again, I try to make it as easy as, my, um, as possible on myself to remember things so I can go back and learn from these uh, from this later. Oh, and I need to take the percentage sign off again. Put it down here on accident, and then put it back up there. I need to put that down there. Put it not right there. That earnings yield is the only one. So the twenty-one point seven percent. Twenty-one point seven percent. That's a percentage. This is a number. A whole number. Um, again below eight higher this number is the better this earnings yield is just an estimate of what you should expect to earn owning the company in the next year if you were to buy it at current rates we can talk more about earnings yields at a later date I actually have a YouTube video about it but I can explain that more in depth at a later training session as well um, what this number is compared to what it means or I already explained what it meant, but what it compares to, because um, usually it's compared to other investments or the treasury yield. Um, but on a preliminary basis, that's it. Um, if I were looking at this company for the first time again, we've talked since we've talked about this, and I've already read the financials, I know what I'm already thinking about the, this company. But on a preliminary basis, if I was looking at this company for the first time, normally I wouldn't. If this was a normal company. I wouldn't continue researching it because these numbers are far below, these margins are far below what I normally look for in a great business. But I invest in three kinds of situations. Um, the first is great businesses uh, with most competitive advantages, great profitability, great cash flow, stuff like that, Warren Buffett type businesses. The second is special situations type investments. This company would not, on a preliminary basis, fit in either of those categories. but because the price to book is so low, this relative valuation is so low, and this earnings yield is so high, I would continue doing um, pr uh, analysis on this company if I was looking at it for the first time because I would consider this an NCAV valuation stock potential. And let's see, let's go back. I've already done this, we've already done this on the other session, but let's do it here. Just as a little bonus. So go back. Okay. So current assets, total current assets. In the trailing 12. Oop. That's another problem you have to watch out for. I left this on annual. I need to make sure this is in the twi trailing 12 month period. Okay. 75.3, 75.3. Total current assets minus total liabilities of two minus two equals seventy three million. Eighty million versus versus market cap of forty four point four million. 
this means 73 minus 44.4 .4 divided by 73 equals 0.2 percent this mean there is the company is selling at a discount of, of to its current MCAV valuation. Um, that is a huge margin of safety, more than what I require on an NCAV um, when I'm looking at an NCAV company. Um, again, we've talked about this already on a preliminary basis, why that doesn't hold up and or why it probably didn't hold up. And then in the next session, we'll, I'll tell you why after reading the financials, this number doesn't hold up. But on a preliminary, again, if I was looking at this company for the first time, I would think that this company is undervalued on a NCAV valuation, which is one of the most conservative valuations you can do, and I would continue research on the company. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. We'll talk soon in our uh, next training session, and we can talk more about all of this and the company's financials in the next session. Uh, talk to you then. Thanks.